the record of people who have suffered an unprecedented disaster. In this episode, we visit the town of Okuma, the site of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. On March 11, 2011, a huge earthquake and tsunami struck the power plant. With systems out of operation, reactor cores melted down and explosions followed. It's so shocking to see something like that. It completely destroyed the myth of safe nuclear power we had always believed. Our neighbors and plant workers believed that nuclear power was safe. They never dreamed that there could be a hydrogen explosion or a meltdown. The long-trusted myth of safety was shattered. Personnel who remained at the plant to work on recovery were helpless in the face of nuclear reactors that were running out of control. Nothing we could do would improve the situation. Even if we restored power, there was so much debris. It was pitch black. All that debris everywhere kept us from making any progress. That's what we were hearing. We wanted to get out as soon as possible. But we couldn't. There were explosions and the terror of radioactivity. These are the voices of people who lived with, and whose town was taken by, the nuclear power plant. Before the disaster, Okuma had a population of 11,000. In half of the households, at least one person worked at the power plant. Now the entire area has been designated a hazard zone, and people are not allowed in. This is the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, located to the northeast of town. It began operation 40 years before the accident. Before the plant opened, there was very little industry in Okuma, and many residents worked away from home. The plant provided jobs that spurred development. They called it dream energy. There was nothing here in this rural area, and they leveled the hills and built concrete company housing. It must have been a festive atmosphere with everyone coming together. People didn't have to leave home to find work anymore, and the town prospered. Lots of things became possible. People thought, well, if I can get a job in a nuclear power field and manage to find a good spouse, then my life will be set. It's like we kind of assumed it was natural to have a nuclear power plant in the community. When we were in elementary school, they'd take us to the plant on school trips to show us how it worked. They told us it was safe. That's how they explained it to us. They presented it to us that way from the time when we were young children. So that's the only way we knew how to think about it. For many years, the people of Okuma believed the myth of nuclear safety. And then disaster struck. A terrifying magnitude 9 earthquake. During the ongoing aftershocks, 6,000 plant employees and contract personnel kept working.
When the earthquake struck, units 1, 2, and 3 were operating. The remaining three units had been shut down for routine inspection. Satoshi Kinoshita was working for a subcontractor. He was erecting a scaffold around Unit 1's reactor building when he felt a violent shaking. That earthquake lasted a long time. There'd be a big shock, then it would be quiet a while, then another shock. Things were moving around so much, it was impossible to walk. I had to crawl on my hands and knees. That was one heck of a quake. In the confusion, most of the workers near the reactors retreated to an office building on the plant grounds. Munehiro Ishida, an employee of a subcontractor, was assigned to maintenance of the reactors. He went to the office to confirm that the reactors had shut down properly and waited there for his colleagues. We confirmed that all of our employees were safe and then gave the okay for everyone to go home. There were a lot of workers at the plant, though, so there must have been thousands of cars trying to get to the highway at the same time. There is only one road from the plant's gate to the highway, and it was completely jammed with traffic. Meanwhile, another disaster was looming. Satoshi had fled Unit 1, heading along the shore, and he realized it was coming. I knew that a tsunami would come. I could see that the water had receded. We had a water intake facility on the shore where we pumped in water. There's a bay there, and the water level had gone way down. A huge tsunami, more than 10 meters high, rushed toward the power plant. The seismic isolation building is located about 300 meters from Unit 1. Designed to withstand large earthquakes, it had begun operating just eight months earlier. About 400 employees took shelter there right after the quake. One of them was Takashi Sato, who also worked for a subcontractor. As an on-site technician, he had a team working under him and nearly 30 years of experience conducting safety inspections. A command center was established in the seismic isolation building. Personnel were ordered to remain on standby for recovery work. To get a better picture of the situation, Takashi kept notes on all the reports that flooded in about the condition of the reactors. We had a monitor hooked up to TEPCO headquarters, so I kept notes on our interactions with them. I also copied down what was written on the whiteboard in the command center. They soon discovered that all of the power sources had been disabled by the tsunami, which meant that the reactors were not being cooled. Just the fact that we had no power was very serious. We felt that the plant was in an extremely dangerous situation. It was pitch black. All that debris everywhere kept us from making any progress. That's what we were hearing. So I knew the work was not progressing at the reactors. Before dawn on March 12th, pressure rose quickly in Unit 1. It was decided to vent some of the air in the reactor out into the atmosphere. I heard they were going to vent the reactor. Of course, I realized that meant there would be radioactive leakage. So I knew the situation wasn't normal. My house was about five kilometers from the plant. 
So naturally, I was worried about my family. But preparations for venting took time, and the situation got worse. Takashi heard officials from TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, engage in tense discussions with the government about when venting would take place. I heard that the Prime Minister's office wanted to talk with Mr. Yoshida, the plant manager. I heard people talking about it. They said that Prime Minister Khan wanted to come and visit the plant at that time. But people working there were occupied with trying to restore power. They couldn't accommodate the Prime Minister's visit. That's the kind of thing they were saying. If the Prime Minister came, all work would come to a standstill. We just didn't have the leeway for that. Radioactive material had begun to leak. At this time, radiation levels at the plant's front gate were eight times higher than normal. A serious crisis had developed at the plant. And yet, neither the national government nor TEPCO provided the neighboring community with reliable information. As a community, we had always talked about coexisting with nuclear power. Coexistence was the watchword. Local residents worked at the plant, after all. Under the circumstances, I expected that they would keep the town informed. Just before dawn, town officials were focused on the coastal district damaged by the tsunami. Jin was busy directing his subordinates when he heard some unbelievable news. We heard that policemen, all dressed up like space aliens in white protective gear and masks, were guiding people. We wondered what was going on. The police told us we had been ordered to evacuate. I couldn't believe it. I called the prefectural disaster headquarters and they told me the same thing. I knew then that we had to get people out of there. That was when the mayor received a call from the prime minister's office telling us to evacuate. Until then, people within three kilometers of the plant were told to evacuate and within 10 kilometers to stay indoors. But at 5.44 a.m., the evacuation zone was increased to 10 kilometers. Shortly after 6 a.m., all residents of Okuma were ordered to leave. However, the government still did not tell residents that there was a crisis at the power plant. When I got up, I thought he was going to walk the dog. But he says to me, we've been ordered to evacuate, that we have to leave right away. I was wearing an apron like this one, and I just kept it on. I didn't even take a change of underwear with me. I thought it was a roll call or something, so I just went with a winter coat, leading my kids by the hand. But some of the other people had overnight bags and lots of other stuff. I wondered why. But when we got to the community center, we were told to get away from the power plant for about three days. One of the evacuees was Munehiro Ishida, who had left the plant right after the earthquake. He began preparations to evacuate with his wife and three children. To be honest, I thought it was just a precaution. I didn't think there was going to be an explosion or that we were in danger. I thought we were evacuating just in case. 
they were talking on the TV about how they were going to vent the reactor, and I knew that some radiation would be released, but I thought they were just venting to relieve the pressure, that's all. So I figured they wanted us to evacuate temporarily because there was going to be some radiation released. That's how I interpreted it. We thought we'd be able to return home after two or three days. We figured it was just a precaution and that we'd be home again in a few days at most. We sort of expected that we'd get some kind of food rations during the evacuation too. It didn't seem that serious to us. Because most people were not given any information, they had no sense of crisis about the power plant. With no clear idea of the actual circumstances, 11,000 people left their town behind. At 2.30 that afternoon, news reached the seismic isolation building that Unit 1 had been successfully vented. Everyone thought that the worst was over. It was then that Takashi, who was on standby, was overwhelmed by a huge booming sound. There was a hydrogen explosion at Unit 1. The ground shook violently, rocking the seismic isolation building. There was this big boom. It was like the ground was trembling, and there was a really horrible noise. Of course, that made us worried. So we went to the main room to see what was going on. And when we got there, we heard people in the command center in a heated discussion. It was like they were panicking, talking about the explosion. They were asking, is anyone hurt? All kinds of information was coming in. People were talking frantically about how many millisieverts of radiation were being found at different locations. That kind of data was coming in as part of the conversations between the people in the command center and the people making measurements outside. So naturally we heard those things. The roof of the reactor building was blown off, sending debris flying everywhere. The force of the explosion destroyed the buildings around the seismic isolation building and injured people. Radiation levels at the plant shot up as high as 230.8 microsieverts per hour. People exposed at that level received the maximum annual dose of radiation for civilians in just over four hours. We had worked at the plant feeling secure in the belief that it was safe. When it exploded, we realized how serious the situation was. Of course, we realized it was serious from the time the reactor was vented, but with the explosion, it became much more urgent. Of course, things were bad in the surrounding area, too, but Unit 1 was just down the hill from where we were in the command center. The unit that had just exploded was right there, close by. Naturally, we feared for our own safety. We wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. At one point, I didn't talk directly to the boss about it, but... I asked one of the supervisors if we could leave. He told me that they wanted us to stay. They wanted our help if something happened. Meanwhile, local residents fled through the hills to the city of Tamura, about 40 kilometers west of the plant. They didn't understand just how serious the situation was until they saw television reports at the evacuation center. 
I thought, wow, this is really awful. I couldn't believe it at first. But when I saw what had happened to Unit 1... After the explosion, all eyes were glued to the TV. We'd been free to come and go, but they began saying we shouldn't go outside. That's when we realized it was dangerous. They told us to stay indoors. They call it indoor evacuation. Once the hydrogen explosion happened, we realized we were in danger. At first, people had gone out walking their dogs, and some people had been sleeping in their cars. One of the evacuation centers in Tamura was Ishimori Elementary School. A sense of crisis had grown there as well. Some people at the center took measures to protect themselves from radiation poisoning. There were officials from the town of Tomioka there at the school. No officials from Okuma were there. There were two Tomioka officials, and they came with some bags and started handing out iodine tablets. They gave us a little instruction pamphlet and told us to read it and to take the pills if it became necessary. I worked at the power plant and no one had ever told me to take iodine pills when I was around high radiation levels. Normally, iodine just isn't in the picture. So when they distributed those pills, I knew that things had gotten very dangerous. Stable iodine can have side effects and normally requires a doctor's supervision. In the confusion, however, the decision whether to take it or not was left up to the residents themselves. They told us it was up to us parents to decide whether or not to give our kids the pills. They said that there were side effects and that if we decided to give them the pills without a doctor's guidance, we'd bear responsibility ourselves. The hard thing was deciding on our own when the pills should be taken. If a doctor gives you direction, you can give the proper doses at the proper times. But we didn't have that kind of medical knowledge. It was very difficult. When should we take them? We kept discussing it. We decided to hold on to them and not use them. We figured we were inside the gym and hoped that would keep us safe. Should they give their children iodine pills? Lacking reliable information about radiation levels, the Ishidas decided against it. Early in the morning of March 14th, pressure inside the Unit 3 reactor building also reached the limit. Despite the recovery efforts of plant personnel, the worst-case scenario was unfolding. They told us to get ready. We might be next. We might have to go in. I was scared. I couldn't help but wonder how much radiation I'd be exposed to. I guess that's what frightened me. And I wondered how long it would take to do the job. By this time, Units 1 and 3 were being cooled intermittently with seawater. Takashi was ordered to prepare for recovery work. That's when it happened. The second explosion was much louder than the one at Unit 1. Panels fell in the walkway connecting to the administration building. I mean the ceiling panels. They they fell down. So I got out of the way. I didn't run away, but I got off to one side. I could see that all the glass was blown out of the administration building. 
There was a general sense of panic among the people working in the command center. A fire truck couldn't come in close because of all the debris. We just couldn't get anything done easily. With the explosion at Unit 3, following the earlier explosion at Unit 1, the command center fell into chaos. Takashi had no choice but to remain on standby. We were there for the recovery work. I think we all wanted to stabilize the plant. I'm pretty sure everyone felt that way. But at the same time, we wanted to get out of there as fast as we could. We wanted to go home and see the faces of our families and be reassured. That feeling was very strong. I didn't know if I would ever see my family again. I didn't know when I'd be able to see them, when I'd be able to leave the plant. I wished I had left on the 12th and then on the 13th. I regretted not leaving, even though they told me to stay. News of the second explosion reached the gymnasium in Tamura where the largest group of evacuees was staying. Takashi's family was among those who heard the news there. They had had no contact with Takashi for three days. My main concern is that my husband is apparently still inside the power plant. That's what really worries me. The explosion at Unit 3 was a decisive event for many of the residents. There was panic in the air as people wondered if they'd ever be able to go home. Things had really gone wrong. A lot of people were saying Okuma was done for. We were feeling angry more than worried. The situation was hopeless. We didn't think we could ever go home. I had no idea what would happen to me and I cried, although I didn't let myself cry in the gym. At the plant, after the repeated explosions, it was decided to pull out as many people as possible that evening, leaving only essential personnel. The plant manager, Mr. Yoshida himself, came out of the command center and into the corridor. He told us it was okay for us to leave and thanked us for our cooperation. We didn't actually do anything, but that's what he said, so we had permission to go. When I left, I felt tremendous relief that I was finally out. I thought about my family waiting at the evacuation center. I wanted to go to them quickly to see their faces. But when I drove out the front gate and headed away from the plant, it was completely dark. There wasn't a single car with headlights coming toward me. It was a very strange sight. As Takashi headed for his family, he noticed that there were messages on his cell phone. They'd been sent in the previous few days, but hadn't reached him because his phone had no reception inside the plant. One of the messages was from his daughter, who had celebrated her birthday at the evacuation center on March 13th. Now this, she said, this is now. I'm eight years old now. I'm fine, so please don't worry. <laughs> it was that sort of ordinary message. It wasn't particularly important. It didn't have any special words or anything. 
It was the simplicity of it. Ishimori Elementary School, one of the evacuation sites in Tamura, was 40 kilometers from the plant. But was that far enough to be safe? People had reached the breaking point. Staying there with no access to reliable information, Munehiro and his family were faced with a decision. Once the hydrogen explosion happened at Unit 3, we just didn't know what would happen next. The reactor building was blown open. If the pressure vessel exploded too, it would all be over. So we thought we'd better leave before that happened. There were other plant employees among the evacuees in the gym. We got together and tried to figure out what to do. We knew things were really bad. I was surprised when I was told that we had to leave. We were managing with our friends at the evacuation center, and now I was being told that it was dangerous to stay. Then it clicked in my own mind that we were still in danger. Most of the people at the evacuation center had come by bus, so they had no cars they could use to leave. So people asked relatives, friends, anybody they could to come and pick them up and get them out of there. We didn't make a general announcement. We just talked to individuals. Otherwise, there would have been panic and a mob scene. So we talked to individuals, starting with younger people. And people with kids. Yeah, we gave them priority. After telling people to leave the evacuation center, Munehiro and his family waited for relatives to come and pick them up, and left Fukushima Prefecture. Most of the evacuees who stayed behind at that time wound up leaving Tamura by the end of March. The day after the explosion at Unit 3, there was an explosion at Unit 4, and the reactor vessel in Unit 2 also suffered damage. According to TEPCO estimates, the radioactive material released during March alone reached 900 quadrillion becquerels, making Fukushima one of the worst nuclear accidents in history. Fourteen months later, some of the people evacuated from Okuma have settled in the city of Aizu Wakamatsu located more than 100 kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi plant. <laughs> Munehiro and his family had temporarily moved further away, but they settled in Aizu Wakamatsu for the sake of their children's schooling. Recently, their son Sodai had his thyroid gland tested under a program run by the prefecture. These are the results of the thyroid exam. It says that Sodai has a small lump or cyst, but that a second examination isn't necessary. They found something, but they're not going to do anything about it. Strange. The prefecture says that at the present time, it's highly unlikely that Sodai's condition is the result of radiation exposure. And since the lump is benign, a second examination is not needed. I called them, and they said that the A2 diagnosis means... There's nothing abnormal, and no further exam is needed. They just repeated what it says here. They also said that 95% of the time, thyroid conditions in children develop slowly, so that there's nothing to worry about.
They'll examine Sodai again in two years, and if they find something wrong, they'll take the next step then. They assured me that there was no need to worry for the next two years, and that I should just wait and see. That was all they had to say. But as a parent, that's hard to accept. The Ishidas have no choice but to accept the prefecture's policy of providing one examination every two years and seeing how things develop. After the disaster, Munehiro started working at the Fukushima plant again. He's involved in the cooling operations for the reactors there and is working toward the day when his children will be able to return to Okuma. We didn't know when the walls might come falling down. And radiation, it can't be seen by the eye. You can't tell where it's high and where it's low. There could be a lethal dose of radiation nearby, so you can't just go wherever you like. Those were the conditions we worked in. We had no idea how much radiation we were being exposed to or when. That was really scary. Whenever he went off to work, he'd say, I came back last time, but I might not come back this time. You said that to me. And the kids too, didn't you? To tell the truth, I'd like to feel resentment, but it's complicated. My husband works for the plant, so I can't really be resentful. It is complicated. After all, we were able to live in Okuma in the first place because the plant was there and gave me work. That's what made it all possible. Will you continue working there? Yes, at least for now. There aren't any other jobs available, so I'll continue as long as there's work. Although more than a year has passed since the catastrophe, the former residents of Okuma have no prospects yet of returning to their hometown. Many people lost their jobs and are now living as refugees with uncertain futures. <laughs> For nearly 30 years, Takashi Sato had worked at the power plant. He evacuated to Aizu Wakamatsu after the disaster. He lost his job because of the accident at Fukushima Daiichi, but decided to continue working in the nuclear power field. <laughs> I'm from Okuma, so this life I have here is really the life of a refugee. I can't go home, that's for sure. I want to go home, but I can't. That makes my feelings pretty complicated. I've worked in the nuclear power field ever since I graduated from high school. That's really been my main occupation. It's the only thing I know how to do. I can't fish or raise crops or take up dairy farming. Well, what about going into public service or becoming a regular office worker? If I were younger, I might give it a try, if I were in my early 20s or so. But I'm in my late 40s, and my child's still young. The idea of switching to another field is inconceivable. For the sake of work, Takashi now lives alone, away from his family. He currently commutes to the Onagawa nuclear power plant, where he's begun working as a safety inspector. What would you do if they asked you to come back to work at Fukushima Daiichi? If TEPCO asked me, I wouldn't hesitate to go. Yes. 
it's work, so I'd go. Like I said before, that's how I make my living. because of the plant and was destroyed by the plant. Even after the disaster, many of the residents still work here. According to estimates made by TEPCO in June 2012, Fukushima Daiichi is still emitting 10 million becquerels of radioactive material per hour. The nightmare that engulfed this community isn't over yet. 